Hi guys and welcome back to another episode of The Sick Sexy. If you're new to the channel, hi, my name is Sophia Anna. I post once a week about all things invisible illness, health, disability and relationships. This week on The Sick Sexy, I'm super excited to bring you my interview with acclaimed British fashion designer, Barbara Bioza and her experience living with invisible illness. Let's take a look. Today, I am so incredibly honoured to welcome Barbara to The Sick Sexy. Barbara is an award-winning fashion designer with her own haute couture label, Dumabai. Barbara has had her designs showcased in fashion shows all around the world, London Fashion Week, Paris and Cannes, just to name a few. Her stunning dresses are worn by celebrities, actresses, singers all around the world. And if her amazing career doesn't inspire you enough, Barbara is also a published photographer and the founder behind Gideon's Treasure, a non-for-profit organisation aiming to raise awareness about a subject that is very close to my own heart, and that is sickle cell anemia. Barbara, thank you so much for being on The Sick Sexy. Thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure to meet you and be on this channel. Oh, no, it's a pleasure and an honour to be able to hold space for you and talk about the importance of invisible illness, but more importantly, sickle cell. So I guess what I want to start with is what was your inspiration behind um, Gideon's Treasure? Um, so because I, was, I have sickle cell and I was diagnosed when I was four years old and um, I didn't I haven't spoken about it as much. Um, Around 10 years ago, when I was a teenager, um, my uncle passed away. So he also had sickle cell. And um, so I knew from then on and like a few years back that I wanted to do something to honor him. Um, I was quite close with him and well, actually really close. And it was really shocking for me because I was part of a support group when I was about 18 or 16, 18. And then I went off to uni. And so um, that was like the only time I really encountered people with sickle cell. And so from being in fashion school to um, working and all of this stuff and just like even building my career in fashion, I never really met anyone with sickle cell. Nobody knew what it was when I did internships or jobs and I had to tell people like, oh, I'm, I can't come in, I'm unwell. Um, no one really understood. They didn't know what it was. And I thought that was a bit shocking. And, and knowing that like there's quite a lot of people who suffer from this condition and it's actually very serious it's really sad that it's like um no like barely anybody really knows and I noticed when fashion I was doing like fashion shows and events and all of that stuff like so many people um will attend a fashion show and is so interested about fashion and like fashion in the entertainment industry is very influential so it would be so good that um using that platform like a something as influential as fashion or entertain entertainment to um spread a light on sickle cell and I also saw like there were like loads of really big charity galas and events like the anthers and all of that stuff that um kind of promotes AIDS or like children in need and I was like there needs to be something that's global and massive to promote sickle cell and so that's really the aim and the goal for Gideon's Treasure was to uh, create a foundation in the memory of my uncle and have it as like something that it mixes fashion, entertainment and everything into one and gets people from all walks of life to come in. Because sometimes when you um, go to like support groups or stuff about sickle cell, it's mainly people of sickle cell and their family and that's it. And there's nobody else out there. And like people in fashion and music and modeling and anything, they should know about this condition the way that they know about other conditions. So it's just something that it shouldn't just be so like within the community of people who know about it. I think it should be like worldwide knowledge. And that's really the big ambitious goal for Gideon's Treasure. Um, so just basically like trying to bring the entertainment side to bring in people and then like shove them with information. This is sickle cell and share mm-hmm. stories and stuff like that and try to help like with, um, yeah. And use my passion for fashion to really kind of push it there. <laughs> that's amazing. And it's such a beautiful message because I think with sickle cell, it is, 
so stigmatized in our culture um, and it, it like shining the spotlight on it in a positive way is so difficult um, as yeah. it is um, and also incorporating fashion fashion is the epitome of what makes a woman feel beautiful so I think the fact yeah. that you're putting the two together is just really inspiring can you tell me a little bit about how you are like intending to incorporate fashion and sickle cell together how that would look for you Okay, so growing up, fashion basically was like my escape. It was my hope. It was something that gave me joy. Like, even when I was in hospital, my mom would, I would like, bring my sketchbook so I can, like, draw and stuff like that. And so um, because it was such a be beacon of hope for me and, like, I had quite a positive, despite, like, the times when I was in hospital, I had a positive um, outlook for the future. Like, I was like, yeah, I'm going to be a fashion designer. I'm going to design. And that was my goal. And I think having that can sometimes when unfortunately you are unwell and you have to go to hospital you may just or even if you get to a point where you can manage your crisis at home but just being at home and not being able to go to school having something that you're passionate about um, can help you get through some situations like it did with me so I basically want to kind of provide that for um, young people anyone anyone of any age of sickle cell who you know wants something that it, to be passionate because I feel like passion does really help with pain so with Good Inch Treasure we want to um, do like workshops um, fashion workshops art workshops um, acting workshops um, uh, even book club and stuff that you can have like community you can do um, it will obviously be all free and just provide it as like a something to bring the community in and have like that joy and that excitement to work towards something with other people that have um, similar um, going through similar things to you with you and that it can also build into like um going into a career it doesn't have to be going into career but it could build into going into career getting jobs in that and just helping people in that path because it really did help me and I think that was why I just have such a positive out life, outlook in life and I've never really felt like I was limited because I knew that there was something that I could do whether I was unwell or not like nobody can stop me from achieving my goals and like so yeah that's definitely what we want to do with Gideon's Treasure and also we want to do um, an annual event so September is like fashion week and it's also sickle cell awareness month yeah so um, so it's like the perfect time to kind of combine the two and so um, right now my brand um, usually we have a digital profile on London Fashion Week and then and um, once a physical shows open up we'll be able to like do a physical show and instead of just doing a normal show just showcasing a collection which is great um, I want to actually create um turn it into a gala like an event where it's like wow. there's music there's entertainment there's a fashion show and then there's guest speakers so I'd love to get um people who have sickle cell and are doing amazing things that could um speak about their experiences and um yeah so I want it to be like an annual thing where it brings people together and really kind of like this is sickle cell this is who we are this is um the seriousness of it this is the struggles but the triumphs and mm -hmm. what we need to help improve people living with this in condition so. it's it's just awe inspiring because I feel that you will definitely bring a lot of youth to events like that as well um because I think there's a, a bigger em emphasis on sickle cell in the older population but when it comes to young men and women you know you want to be able to tailor events to people your own age so that they, you know, understand what you're going through, but also being able to give that positivity back into the world is so important. So that's just amazing. And I hope that one day when travel isn't completely restricted, that maybe I'll be able to come over and watch yes. one of your shows and <laughs> that would just be amazing. <laughs> to be part of it and to come <laughs> yeah definitely so for those that don't know um what what is sickle cell anemia um and like can you share what type of treatment you receive for it if you receive any treatment for it and just how you live with that okay so sickle cell it's an inherited blood disorder so um basically instead of get, I won't get too technical but like so we have like the red blood cells and usually they're quite a circle shape and they go through the blood vessels pass through easily um with sickle cell um they can be sickled so it's like kind of like a crescent moon or like a sickle shape and because of that it kind of blocks um it will block some of the vessels and like the blood vessels is what carries like oxygen to all of your lung, all of your organs. And so when you have that blockage, it can cause crisis and it can also cause like serious complications. And so um, a lot of people with sickle cell, depending on like 
triggers. So whether it's weather or stress um, can have like painful crisis due to this. And so I think that's pretty much like the technical side of it. And so living with sickle cell, um, I think when I was diagnosed at four, I had, I was having some cri like crisis. So it'll start with like maybe arms, it could be your legs. It's mainly like joints. Um, chest pain is and back pain is one of the most serious crises that I have. Um, over the years, my mom was very adamant of me staying away from hospital. So she really just didn't like hospital. And I think obviously her brother had sickle cell, my uncle. And so she kind of saw how um, his, how, like, his condition was treated and like the hard drugs that the, sometimes they give you. So my mom was always like more on the, she tried to be more on the holistic side. Like I used to drink banana tea. It's like you um, boil all these skins of the bananas and then you drink the, the juice that comes out of it wow and, um, what, what 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 kind of healing properties does that have to be honest it was really good because from the age of like five no so five to eight I was in hospital in and out in and out from four to eight and then from eight to 16 and I was in primary school I actually didn't go to hospital during that period I did have crisis at home but like my mom was the kind of person she taught me like some endurance sometimes and prevention is better. So um, at home, I would take like maybe ibuprofen and then um, maybe move to like codeine. We always were able to get oral morph, but that was only if it got really bad. And then the only time I'd go to hospital if it was like a temperature, because um, if you have a temperature with a crisis, it could be something like an infection and it could be really serious. So um a lot of the times she would just like hot water bottle, heat creams, um, those pain med medicines. And, you know, there were in certain situations where um, I would have to take oral morph. And then after 16, that was when like the hormonal pains came in and like hormonal changes, I would say, because um, I was becoming a teenager. And that's when it was like I was getting crisis almost every month and going into A&E. And that was just my doctor kind of explained it was because like my body was changing until like adult from like being child. And that's the point when I kind of was getting a bit afraid, like, oh, my God, is this what my future is going to be like? Am I going to be in hospital all the time? Is, and um, so I if I had to go to hospital, there was sometimes diamorphine and like um, which is like an injection. Um, and yeah, so I try to avoid that because my my mom was always adamant that sometimes it could be damaging to the body taking that frequently. And there's been times when I've had to like endure pain, like just like have heat hot water bottles and heat creams and like take the medicines at home and like wait the whole day, like just feeling pain the whole day. Cause I was like, it's better than going for hospital. And I don't recommend that always to um, people. Cause I know like if the crisis gets to a certain level obviously you should go to the hospital. But um, I always notice that when I go to hospital this is very random. I always get a temperature. <laughs> like my temperature was too high and I'm like <laughs> yeah it happens to me as well I think I think it's like you're so stressed at the idea that you'll be admitted and you won't be able to leave yeah. and I think also our body holds on to trauma when we've been through yeah. a lot and so I think if as a child you've had crises and you've had a negative experience in a hospital your body kind of tries to protect you and so I think maybe attempt like because I know that some people with sickle cell at least I can only speak for myself but I do run a little bit hotter than most people do you find that that happens with you oh like you're always hot your body's always warm yes yeah yeah I'm well actually I'm I'm someone who's usually more cold but my body's quite like I'm I'm very warm-blooded and like at night I'm like super hot yes. like and I can't keep the heating on but like I'm like super like hot so yeah I think yeah. Ooh, it's interesting <laughs> yeah so now so now that you're like from your childhood to obviously being on these heavy you know opioids which again I understand how you feel because I spent a majority of my childhood in exactly the same way um when you you know obviously through your teen years, you had those hormonal changes. And now that you're an adult, what are some of the treatments that you use to prevent crises, um, if you can prevent them? Um, and yeah, how do you keep yourself healthy? Okay, so uh, after that period of like turning 16 and the body changing, I realized what the triggers were. So for example, it was happening every month, specifically near my menstrual cycle. So usually around that period of time, because I would rather avoid having crisis, even if I don't go to hospital, when you have a certain crisis, there's at least a week or two where you can't do nothing or you're like, I'm lying in bed. And to prevent that, because obviously like, um, 
with my career and everything that I do, you can't just be like in bed <laughs> for every month, like trying to. So what I would do is just um, try to take it a bit easier that period of time. And obviously living in um, the UK where the weather is mainly cold, like if someone was inviting me out for to go out or something and I knew I was on that period and um, the weather was cold and I wasn't like, I didn't have a car at the time and I like public transport all I have to put that into consideration and be like is it really worth it me going out knowing that I'm probably I'm vulnerable at this period of time and I'm going to get a crisis so sometimes it was just past as an adult I realized there's certain situations where I should pass and um, it doesn't mean not live your life or like not go out because there's so many other things you can do. And if it's only a few days or week where you know you're super vulnerable, because I noticed that was a main trigger for me. So even like I try to do like light exercises, like on an exercise bike or go walking, even during that period, I would just not do it that week and be like, OK. And then um, I try to eat healthy, drink. I drink so much water, like <laughs> I'm like two liters or more a day. I'm like always drinking water. And um, yeah, so that has helped with knowing the triggers. That has definitely helped with me preventing a lot of crises. And that's, so I don't get crises as often because I'm very cautious. I carry jackets all the time. Even when the sun is out, I'm like in a, like people would always ask me, why are you carrying so much stuff? I'm like, you, like, you don't know, <laughs> like it's better. So I've, I've definitely become someone because I was like, I, when you listen, when you know your body, you start to listen to your body and know exactly like there could be random days where you start to feel a little thing, like maybe it's just a little ankle or wrist pain or something. Yes. And that one stuff like that really just I know I really listen to because I know um, I don't like being like the being in pain is just I, I don't like obviously nobody likes pain. But when you've experienced like having to go to hospital, or even just take the medication, I'm not someone who likes taking medication a lot and like heavy drugs and stuff. So it's just something that I've kind of trained myself in a way of like, when I need to rest, I rest. If I need to take it easy. And my mom always taught me like, sometimes when you have a health condition, sometimes you have to put yourself first. Yes. And so even like with jobs, like if they told me to do something where it was like, um, I remember I did an internship because I studied in New York and they wanted me to carry like huge fabric to like four blocks and it was like um, on a pusher thing and it was like during winter time in New York so it was freezing and like halfway I couldn't even like go I was like my hands are freezing this thing is heavy and I'd already told them I had sickle cell there was times that I'd been off but every time I'd come back I would be dressed in heels and a dress and they would kind of not believe because they didn't know what it was so I think at that point they got annoyed and I had to they had to send another intern to come and help me and when I got back they actually fired me from an, a free intern an unpaid internship wow. they were like we need someone who's a bit more reliable so this was a company in New York and they're quite a a famous company um but um yeah so they were a bit like oh we need someone who's they did it try to be nice we need someone a bit more reliable and all of this stuff and I was kind of over it because I was just like I'm not carrying heavy <laughs> fabric in the cold like like I'm, I'm a very small person already and then I have the condition so there was just certain things where it's like if you know just you have to you have to speak out and that's something that's helped me with like um keeping well is speaking out um knowing my body like if I know there's like yeah so that's basically what's helped and then trying to endure the pain um with the lower like with start with like ibuprofen or something not as strong and um, yeah so that's what I've been doing as an adult um, have you have you ever had um have you ever been offered bl at blood transfusions or um apheresis or anything like that or hydroxyurea to, to keep on top of the crises or did you generally prefer to self-manage at home um, so I did have a blood transfusion once um, and that was, it was really weird. I, so I used to live in Paris because I studied my, in Paris and I started the business kind of there. And then when I moved back, um, so I would work a lot, lot. And I always say like it was adrenaline because generally I'm quite tired all the time. But like um, because of my passion for fashion and like excitement for stuff I'm always working on gelatin so I'm always like God is giving me the strength to do this so I just did a fashion show and I came back to I moved back to London and I was like 
I think all the adrenaline left and I was exhausted. I literally was like slept for like a month. <laughs> like I was just like in bed for hours, like going. And then I had low, one day I had low energy. I got into a crisis and I went to hospital and they said my blood level went really low. And because I'd never had a blood transfusion before, it was very weird. And I was like, this is so weird because I'm like, I'm usually always doing so much activity. And it, it almost felt like it was a crash. And maybe my body didn't know how to react with like, going from like doing something every day and being like that to and that was actually the first time in my life I had like a blood transfusion because it was like um they said it was too low and then I was in hospital already I think my I've had a chest infection or something so I was already in hospital like having a drip and all of that stuff and then they said that I had to and I actually didn't want to because I was like no like why like because at that point I thought I was managing it well like even though I'd go to a &E here and there and stuff I thought I was managing it so um, that was the only period with that. I have had some doctors who said that I should um, think about hydroxyurea, but I just still like, I don't know. I just felt like I've had heard some bad things about it and I just don't want something that will, it was just weird how he said it. I kind of feel like, are they getting paid <laughs> to, to like promote this drug? So that's how I feel with that. I've had like, I know my mom knows some people with sickle cell who were on it and it's like hit and miss, like they've had some, maybe a crisis has stopped, so it's less frequently, but then they've had like really bad side effects. So it's almost like, I don't know. And so I feel like I'm managing it okay. Well, it sounds like you're managing it really well. And it sounds like you also are very self-aware of your own body, which is really important to know your triggers and know what, you know, makes it worse and what makes it better. So, you know, that's really inspiring that you, you kind of know when to stop and when to slow down, because I feel like a lot of people don't know how to do that. Um, and I guess that kind of flows into my next question, which is, you know, with great, with great hard work, with great sorry with great success comes great hard work and you've mentioned you know you've you've obviously traveled a lot you've you know invested your your life into your career um and it's it's amazing but how do you balance um having you know a, a and I, th I feel like as someone with sickle cell we often try to focus on the positive aspects of what it means to live with with a lifelong condition like this without really sometimes I think we kind of make it look easy because we're so high functioning but you know like in your experience how have you balanced those two paradigms the career and having sickle cell um I think for me um being self-employed helped a lot because I remember when I worked for other people even with the internship for other jobs it was hard like I've had internships or like a fashion job where I worked for I think two three months and then the day that we had the fashion show I had a massive crisis like crying in front of straight like the people the in the, the other team and like my mom had to come and um take me like go to the hospital from where I was so I've noticed that the, I think definitely the reason why I can actually manage it as good as I'm doing right now is simply because I work for myself and I would I know it, obviously it's um, not everyone can do that, but I do believe like that does help because having an, an employer, especially with something that a lot of people don't know about, it can be kind of demanding. And having my own business, even at the time, like before lockdown, I had I have a workshop, so I had like a team. Even with that, I could during like we would work from like ten to seven and be sewing in the workshop. So it was in the back of my parents' house and they had a garage that we renovated. And some during, sometimes during the day, I would just go inside and take a nap. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> because I needed it. But if I was working for another employer, because I have like, the anemia is strong. Like I can fall asleep. I could be talking to you right now and, and just fall asleep. Like if, I know like how I, that feels. <laughs> so um, having a, when you work for somebody else, it can actually, I think that is very hard, like for having, having sickle cell because any moment you can feel something or you want to go home or you're tired or something and you can't do that so definitely I would say um, it actually helped more because there is a lot having your own business is a lot there's a lot of work because it's like it's your business you can't always rely on other people and you have to do a lot of the things especially in the beginning when you're still striving you're like uh, right now apart from the interns I'm like I basically do everything else. So apart from the interns that help with so many stuff, I'm like emailing and um, I now started working with a PR team, which is taken off the load, but I still have so much to do. But the, 
thing with working for yourself is like you can actually I can do it later in the evening if during the day I'm exhausted sometimes my energy is quite low in the mornings I've noticed um even if I have to wake up and I can do stuff I have more energy at night and it's really annoying because then I'll be up at like 2am like <laughs> with ideas and stuff like that so when you work for yourself you actually have the flexibility to sleep during the day and then like do your work at other times I do it in the weekends I do it even when I'm traveling and stuff so I think that's definitely helped with my journey because I do remember when I did work for other people there was always times when I had to email or call in the morning and it was always mm. I hate like um last minute like I can't come in because it's very unprofessional mm. but it's just like you can actually wake up in the morning and at nine you're fine no at seven you're fine but when you need to leave the house at nine just like before work starts you can just bam and you're like oh I can't go in like and so that's definitely helped with that because it's like being able to work for myself is definitely and then the support I have for my family and everything is definitely really helped um and then God um I'm I believe in God and I feel like God gives me so much strength so like sometimes I don't even know the answer to questions because I'm like it's just God like I pray <laughs> and <laughs> he makes a way but yeah that's so beautiful that's so beautiful and I think it's it's so important to have a strong supportive uh, network around you whether that's career or family and and having those people that really understand what you're going through and know when to give you the flexibility to to stop and slow down and yeah if you need to take a nap in the middle of the day that's amazing yeah. it's very it's very Parisian I like it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so here on The Six Sexy, I talk a lot about what it means to feel beautiful um, and what it means to feel sexy because I feel like in our culture, when you think of the word sick and sexy, they don't really go together. And yeah. I guess I just want to know as a, as a businesswoman, as a fashion designer, but also as someone who is living with this chronic health condition, how do you feel sexy? How do you feel empowered? Um. Definitely. I'm very like into glamour and like doing my hair, um, dressing up. Like I think the fashion aspect of me, I've always loved um, like heels and dresses. Like I'm barely seen in like jeans or anything like that. I'm very girly. And so I think just that already growing up since I was like 16, I was like buying heels and stuff that already is kind of um, built, like molded me into someone who's like, I'm fabulous. <laughs> and like also, um, so my culture, my um, heritage, like I'm Nigerian. And so growing up, my, my mom's like my inspiration. So I would see her get ready for Nigerian parties and have all like the galets and the, the attire and everything. And I loved it. Like I was, and she would always have so much lipstick. So I'm always like, I've always loved that aspect. And I've never, it's interesting because um, with Nigerian culture, they're, they're so, they're very confident. So I think growing up with a mom, he was like that, um, always confident and like African women apart like they're very kind of you know they're curvaceous they're like but they don't care like any size they are like you'll see them at a party and they like they look they think they're the best person in the world they know <laughs> so how to they know how to own it <laughs> yeah and I think growing up with that we always was like oh I love it like I love that whole like confident like they they're happy with themselves they love themselves and I think that definitely helped with me growing up just because our, our family was very confident in who they were and so I kind of picked that up from a young age. And um, with this, the funny thing with the sickness, like this being um, having an invisible illness, um, when I was in secondary school, I didn't see the sick stigma at first. It was like a get out of free card, like kind of a gel free card. Um, like, you know, like um, I, I could get away with not doing PE. So I'd be like, I have sickle cell, I can't do PE. Or like if, if I was tired <laughs> during the day or I wasn't unwell, like I was feeling like, oh, I couldn't continue the day. I could be like, I have sickle cell. Or if I needed to wear, they have this weird thing because we have a school uniform and they make, you're not allowed to wear like hoodies and stuff. You, and so sometimes I'd have to come with extra layers. Even if I had the jumper, I would still have like a hoodie. And I remember when I had like a substitute teacher and they're like, oh, you can't wear this pink hoodie. And I'd be like, I have sickle cell. Like I have a no. That it was like, <laughs> it was, at first it was like, cause like, there was, I don't know. There was just, my family didn't make me feel like it was a stigma. I know in Nigerian culture, it's very like stigma, stigmatized. Mm. And like people don't say anything. Mm. And it wasn't until I got older that I realized, uh, but when I was in secondary school, like a teenager, I didn't notice. And I remember one day um, we were in science uh, class and there was a, a book about stuff and sickle cell was there. And because all of everyone knew that I had 
um, sickle cell. I don't think they knew what it was. It was just like, yes, yeah, you can't do PE or something. <laughs> so I remember. <laughs> she doesn't come to sports day. It's fine. <laughs> And I remember in the book, it said that, because it was an old book, and I remember that it said that people with sickle cell don't live in um, past 21. And at the time, I was like 15. And I remember I was having beef with some girl. And so I did, we weren't talking. And she even came up to me and was like, are you okay? And it was like a weird day, because I was like 21. And then I went home, and obviously, I spoke with my mom. And she was like, no, that book is a um, thing. We know people that are like 17, that they have things. So she reassured me. And then as I got older, I think I dated some guy and um, I was like so casual about it. I was like, yeah, um, I wasn't feeling well thing. I have sickle cell. And he was like, what is that? Like cancer? Like that was his reaction on the phone because I was so used to just like, this was the thing I just told people like, I can't do this. I have sickle cell. <laughs> like it was so normal because my mom made it like, yeah, don't, you can't, you don't have to do this. Tell them. So I grew up with just thinking it was like, oh, this is what I have it wasn't until I got older and started to realize like oh people don't actually talk about this that much or like in African culture it's like a negative thing like um apparently like if you're living in Africa and you have sickle cell people don't want to marry you or something like because they're like oh it's going to be like a burden or I don't know so that was when it was like a realization so um I think after as I got older I refrained from the saying it as much as possible so I would only tell close friends if like we were going out and they needed I could have a crisis like because I've been at cinema with a friend and then we'll at the end of the movie I got a crisis and I had to pick me up so there were so there were times when um so I would always tell people as an adult if I was really close with them and like we were going out just in case something happened and they'll be like what you were fine like five minutes ago but I never I, I kind of refrained of just like saying it or like employers or teachers and stuff so I think I wasn't as vocal um like it was basically my like 2020 I was kind of like I think it's time because you know I'm always promoting fashion and all this but I have something that it's so many people have and like um they may have not had the same support system or the passion and they're struggling and they need to see more stories of people who are are thriving with this condition Absolutely. Think, it's yeah. so important to it's so important to see someone with any kind of invisible illness thriving, but so so importantly, sickle cell, because I feel like when you're especially a child with this condition, you're just told how limited your life is going to be, right? And so to then go on and excel in career and, and be able to show the world that actually no just because I have sickle cell doesn't mean that I can't be successful. It's so empowering and powerful to share that with other women. Yeah, definitely. And it's so lovely because um, since like 2020, I've just been meeting amazing women like yourself. And Thank like you. as soon as I saw you, I was like, oh my God, she's so amazing. She's beautiful. She's like talented. She has so much. Cool. Like, I love your channel. I love that you're, you have a book coming out, which I'm going to buy. <laughs> um, so I'm just like, yes, this is what I want to see. Because also when I was a teenager and I had that support group, a lot of, I was probably the youngest there. And a lot of them, um, it wasn't that, because I was the youngest, I didn't really see anyone my age group. And then some of them were married or they had kids and or their crisis or their conditions was a bit, um, I wouldn't, worse or just certain stuff. And then my brother also, he added me to a lot of groups because he was, like a treasure on the support group and he added me to all these sickle cell groups on Facebook and so um when I was studying and I would see on Facebook it would be like RIP or this person or pictures of people in hospital and and because I was still growing I was like um like especially when you're when if you're still a teenager and then you're seeing people just a bit older than you and it's like they're dying and all this stuff you start to think is that my future is this just like a grace period that I'm having Mm -hmm. And it's gonna, and even now, like, because I, I, I'm still young, like, I, I, sometimes I'm like, I hope it doesn't get worse, or I hope something doesn't trigger it, or I hope this, this, and so it's always good to see people like your age group and older and doing and thriving and and like, because it you, you, it can be kind of scary because especially when it's like the unpredictability of it, like when you hear oh this person died and you're like how and they're like had a complication how yes. Like, like yeah. how I want yeah, to and it, and it's, yeah. you don't want to just be a statistic you know yeah. um there, something that really bothers me is that you know whenever I read about sickle cell because I'm a public health student so whenever I get the opportunity to make a poster or you know um do a powerpoint presentation or talk about 
an illness, I always choose sickle cell um, because I think it's really important to spread awareness here in Australia because here, over here, we're a little bit um, kind of tucked away from the rest of the world. So there's not as much information. And one of the things that really gets me is that a lot of the statistics are, um, you know, places like Africa where children as young as five die from this condition and, and don't actually reach you know their teen years and so reading about this is it's heartbreaking and it's really really hard but at the same time um you're not a statistic and your life yeah. is your life and you yeah. know you you can only speak for yourself and so telling yourself that yes while this is life-threatening so is diabetes people die from diabetes every yeah. day but there are also just as many people who manage it yeah so well yeah and I- yeah so with um with things like because you mentioned that Korea you found a really good balance with that um and it sounds like your mum has really helped you to normalize the condition and you know help you to feel proud of who you are and also I love the fact that you you are so grounded in your self-esteem that if someone you can't let anyone push you so you won't let someone put you in a compromising situation has that been difficult with um relationships or friendships at all to like I guess explain to them how you feel and get that understanding um it's difficult because of the way I've been up like brought up because like my mom and my family and specifically like my siblings and even my sister were always kind of like you know they taught me to be tough and like um be direct and stuff and like my family are very direct so I think with people um I would say maybe certain situations, my directness was a bit like, oh, (laughs) but um, in general, I don't think, I I don't know. I don't know if it's been like, because you're like with friends, because with friendships, like. Yeah. So like, have you, when it comes to your friends, are they all very accepting? Are they, do they respect your boundaries? Do they know like when to like stop when it comes to inviting you to events or things like that? Oh yeah. So the ones that I kind of tell, they're kind of, they're very aware and they're like, very like with that. So they're like, they will be like, Oh, especially like the closest ones. If they know, and they've they've known me for years and they've seen maybe I've had a crisis or something like that. So yeah, they're very kind of aware, but at the same time, because of my personality and the way I am, I don't, um, I'm, I'm not the kind of person who, um, I wouldn't tell them as much unless like they called or they asked. So when I'm having crisis, sometimes I don't actually tell people. It would just be like my family that knew, no. And then if someone invites me out and they know, I would just be like, oh, I'm sorry, I couldn't come last week. I was unwell. So um, I think with that, I've always just, I've kind of made it, because they maybe didn't know much about it. I've kind of normalized it for them too. So they weren't, I don't think they're as scared or worried or like, is she like, so I feel like they always just invite me and then it's just up to me to be like, oh, I'm not feeling well this week. And it's kind of like that understanding. That um, understanding. And then, like that. Yeah. Cause that's, I think I, I'm just very like direct to it. Oh yeah. I have this health condition. <laughs> Sometimes I'm unwell. So if I can't come like, and I, I think the way I described it as well is just made it like, I'm okay. And I don't know if that's a, a way of brushing off or just make, not making it a big deal. Um, but that's just generally how I'm, I'm with like health and stuff. I'm just a bit like, oh, I can't come. I'm not, I'm not feeling well today or like, and so I am definitely brushing off. With relationships, um, I would say I'm, I try, I don't tell it in like the very beginning now because of that incident that I had with a guy. I was like, what is that? And it's only, I don't think I've, the last relationship I had, I don't think I actually said anything about it. Because, wow, and it, really? <laughs> That's amazing. It was, it was, <laughs> but obviously, because I, I want to, I, I, I think I'm away, I'm way of age. So I want to get married soon. And definitely like the next person I meet, I definitely want to be vocal and tell them about it. And so, um, cause that used to be one of the things I was a little bit worried more in the relationship thing, not simply because, 
because people don't know about it so when they hear it they might be like what is that yes yeah because there is still that stigma there unfortunately but I think you know what's what's amazing about someone who's so confident like yourself is that you will know when the time is right to share that and the person that you pick I'm sure will be loving and understanding and compassionate I'm sure you're not going to date someone who's who has that kind of stigma against invisible yeah. illness because I've definitely been in that situation where I dated someone who turned it into this huge situation and, you know, this story is that I always tell is that we went to a wedding and he asked me to wear a really long dress because it would cover my limp and I kind of knew then that it probably wasn't going to work out. <laughs> yeah, like, bye, I can wear what I want. <laughs> bye, Felicia. <laughs> I kind of knew maybe you're, and then he, I had a blood exchange and he fainted during it and I was like, mm, maybe, oh, maybe what? not. <laughs> Maybe my future oh, husband has to, has to be okay with blood. <laughs> he painted. Oh, but. <laughs> yeah, wow. so but I have, no, like I have no doubt in my life. mind that, you know, you will, you'll go through life with the same amazing choices you've made in your career and your friendship with whoever you choose to date. <laughs> oh, so, yeah, because that, that's something I'm a bit like, the because the conversation, but I also tell myself in my mind, it's inherited blood disorder. It's not something that should be. Because I, my, in my mind, I'm like, this actually shouldn't have stigma to it. Like, mm. it, it, other like like you said, diabetes and other conditions, it's not stigmatized. So I'm just like, that's the thing I want to kind of change the narrative of it. It's like, we also shouldn't feel like that having it. Because I'm like, it's actually, you know, it's it's a, something to do with genetics. And it's, it's, it's not something. So I think that's how I would want to in my mind to approach it so when I tell Mr. Wright <laughs> they'll be like this is what I have and you will accept it and you'll you'll either deal with it or you won't <laughs> yeah I love that you'll be there in the hospital and I do <laughs> oh my goodness well Barbara thank you so so much for your time um I'm so grateful and so honored that you took time out of your day to um have this interview with me um I'm just I love all of your work and everything that you're doing and I just wish you the most success with Dumabai becoming huge which I'm sure it already is in England but um yeah I'd love to see I'd love to see more des- more Duma by designs here in Australia. So I will definitely spread the word about it. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. It's been such an honor and a pleasure. Like I love your channel and I'm so excited and I love everything that you're doing and you're inspiring. Your story is inspiring and I'm so excited to share it all day.